Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Hey, I'm Gina. And I'm Amber. And we're here to bring you the Weird True Crime Podcast, where we cover true crime cases that will leave you asking yourself, did that really happen? We'll dive into questionable cases throughout history that are solved, unsolved, or just plain unbelievable. We'll also talk about the quirkier side of true crime in episodes we like to call What the F*** Wednesday. So be sure to subscribe and listen on your favorite podcast service. Hey, you must know by now this is a true crime show, and I use fun, colorful words at times. Listen carefully, you might learn some new ones. And by that, I mean listen at your own discretion. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. I was contacted by a friend that I'm going to keep nameless, but this friend brought to me a very disturbing situation or maybe just a disturbed individual that I'll be bringing up in a little bit. This person seems to be part of TERF. You might be wondering, what the fuck is a TERF? T-E-R-F is actually an acronym for Terrible Energy Releases Farts. (laughs) Just kidding. You know how I love acronyms. What it really stands for is Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminism. Essentially, it's just another group to entice hate among a marginalized community. In this case, the hate is against trans folk, in particular trans women. Probably one of the most famous of these members is J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series. She is big into the TERF organization. And I wouldn't doubt it if Caitlyn Jenner was a part of this hate group, since she seems to be a huge hypocrite. She's not a fan of other transgender people at all. Not to mention her having a love affair with the orange dude. For any woman or LGBTQ member to be Trumpers? (laughs) I just can't with them. But that's another Oprah show. Back to TERF. Right there in the group's name, you have the word exclusionary. As in excluding certain people. Somebody put these bitches back into their time machine and send them back to the 1800s, up to the late 1960s. That's when segregation was deemed acceptable by the majority of the public, even though it shouldn't have been. In all honesty, I can totally get behind the whole feminism part of this group, but not the anti-trans hateful part. What I don't understand is how a group of anyone, including women, who've gone through hundreds of years of discrimination, can be so damn judgmental of a marginalized group. Do they not know their history? Did they not learn nothing about the suffragettes? Even modern-day history of the simplest things, like men making more money in the workplace than women, or a woman's haircut costing much more than a man's, Those are both biases against women, and it's those kind of prejudices that should be enough for feminists to advocate for, without having to spew hate towards a group of people who already have to fight for their basic human rights. From researching, I learned that the founder of the term TERF is a heterosexual cisgendered woman named Viv Smith. Viv is also a feminist. Nothing wrong with that. But when she came up with the term TERF almost a decade and a half ago, she had no idea radicals would weaponize the trans-hostile rhetoric and use it to develop hateful agendas against trans people, in particular trans women. Viv had also said it was a passionate trans advocate online that taught her how dehumanizing the term has become. She really no longer claims having anything to do with the term or the group, especially after she witnessed the discrimination of trans women at a feminist music festival in Michigan. I believe in August of 2015 was the last of this women's musical festival event. 
And that's because LGBTQ organizations were coming down hard on the event planners of the festival because they excluded trans women from attending. In the meantime, others have adapted the term TERF, including some gays and lesbians, and they've joined forces and have been verbally attacking trans people. And those people are even trying to exclude them from being part of the LGBTQ community. These are LGBTQ folk, or simply LGB, and they wish to drop the T from our acronym. That just really pisses me off. We know what exclusion is like. We know what bullying feels like. And we know what it's like to not be wanted, accepted, or to even feel safe. So tell me, why the fuck do we have members of my community trying to oust people for living their truths? It makes no sense whatsoever. So there's this woman in the Los Angeles area named Amy Ichikawa. She is definitely a member of TERF. She's a former inmate from the California prison system. She's been using her experiences from prison for what seemed to be an advocacy group for females in prison. And that's great, but it's gone on to include turf views and verbal attacks of trans people in prison, especially trans women who are incarcerated. Amy has gone on record to say that trans women should not be in women's prisons because they're rapists. And these trans women would rape the natural-born women in prison. Now, that's quite the generalization. It's pretty much like saying all gays have AIDS and all lesbians want to be men. When in truth, a trans woman placed in an all-male prison is much more likely to be assaulted and raped. Amy's group is part of the gender ideology people with some religion tossed in. They believe there are only two genders, male and female. And if you were born into a certain body, Even if you are not comfortable in it, tough shit. You're going to have to wear it your whole life and be miserable and depressed. Think of it this way. Imagine having to wear underwear that are five sizes too small for you, 24 hours a day, your whole life. I just don't think I could do that to make another group of people happy. Amy uses a lot of religious vehicles to transport her hateful words such as Christian podcasts, YouTube shows, and even radio to spread her views and those of turf believers that trans women aren't real women, but sexual predators. If a trans woman in prison is a sexual predator, it's extremely rare. And as I said, more often than not, trans women are victims of rape and sexual assault when they're in a male prison. Amy's organization is Women to Women, and this is their mission statement. Women to Women believes that the only way to complete rehabilitation from a lifestyle that led to incarceration is through a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our ministry, oh, so it's a ministry, that explains a bunch, is about showing up for the forgotten, extending ourselves in love, (laughs) and sharing the tools we've used and continue to use in our own journey of reconciliation and healing. We strive to empower, educate, and energize our community by helping them know and feel that they are worthy of being loved and valued in the kingdom of God. We believe fully and truly that there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. John fifteen thirteen, Yeah, so that last part there was an excerpt from the Bible. So we have yet another politically right-winged religious organization who claims to help women who've been incarcerated. And at the same time, they discriminate and try to expel and ostracize trans people. If they're so damned religious... They know we are all created in God's likeness, and God is indeed watching over all his children. That means God can be none too pleased with the haters. I don't know what God, that these people who have so much angst against certain groups or individuals worship, but as far as I'm concerned, they can keep their God. Sounds more like a demon to me. 
and that was quoted from CJ 1621. In an article I found called Trapped and Afraid, the article asked the question, Do men belong in women's prisons? I personally say no, they absolutely do not. But here's where the semantics get tricky. And honestly, it's not really the semantics, but rather narrow-minded thinkers. Trans women are not men. They are women. Yes, some have not completed their entire transitioning. So they may still have appendages that don't belong to their bodies. And if they're trans men, maybe they need an appendage that's not there yet. In 1986, Dee Farmer, a black trans woman, was arrested. She was convicted and incarcerated for credit card fraud. She was put into a medium-security men's prison and thrown into the general male population. A couple of years later, she was transferred to another prison that was a high-security federal men's prison, and it had a bunch more violent inmates. Dee wasn't violent. Her crime was fraud. So the transfer seems silly, really. Within two weeks of her transfer, she was raped and beaten by her male cellmate. It potentially exposed her to the HIV virus. Her face was swollen, she had cuts and bruises on her mouth, a cut on her back, and an anal tear from being raped. Dee was humiliated and had mental anguish. She sued the prison system for violating her Eighth Amendment which is about no cruel and unusual punishment being inflicted. It took many years, but Dee's case was finally heard by the Supreme Court, and they ruled in Dee's favor. Dee's case is just one in thousands, just like it. A trans woman who calls herself Mary was put into a male prison where she was raped over 2,000 times. She did not want violent sex with any of these other inmates. But finally, she succumbed to the rapes due to not wanting to be beaten by the inmates either. Because she tried escaping three times, she was labeled a high-risk prisoner, and they put her into a maximum security male prison. And then she was even with more violent male prisoners. Mary said she wasn't trying to escape for any other reason than to avoid the sexual assaults that were placed upon her. Studies have shown in California. Trans women in a male prison are 13 times more likely to be violently raped and sexually assaulted than non-transgender prisoners. Okay, to be fair, several trans women in female prisons have raped other female inmates. The statistics are not nearly as high as trans women being raped in men's prisons, though. But it does happen from time to time. In 2018, a 52-year-old UK trans woman named Karen White, she raped two female prisoners while she was serving time. Karen had not gone through complete transitioning, and she still had her penis. But Karen was also a male rapist before incarceration. Honestly, I feel like there needs to be some important criteria considered when placing trans folk in prisons. Like, are they there for a violent crime? If so, maybe there needs to be a prison in each country strictly for trans folk. Those prisons should also be ran by trans people, a trans warden and trans guards, people who are empathetic enough to know what trans folk are already going through. If they're not being incarcerated for a violent crime, then they should be in a prison of their preferred gender. See, CJ has all the answers. But back to Amy and her group, Women to Women, who like to show up at events and spew their hate-driven speeches throughout these events, along with protest signs and hateful energy, much like Fred Phelps and his Westboro Baptist Church freaks, you know, the religious group that enjoyed showing up at funerals for children clad with God hates veg signs. One of the articles Amy wrote about on a Christian post forum was regarding a Christian friend of hers in prison. The friend, a woman, was using the bathroom, and a 6'5 trans woman prisoner walked in on her, invading the woman's privacy. Okay, so this Christian woman was on the shitter, and another very tall woman walked in. So what? The tall woman didn't attack the Christian friend of Amy's. 
she invaded her privacy on the pot. Apparently, that woman didn't have kids or pets because you have no privacy sitting on the toilet if you do. And rest assured, Amy wouldn't have anything to write about if a cisgendered woman walked in on the Christian friend. Right here, I would like to make a call to action for my listeners. Amy Ichikawa and the Women to Women cult is planning on making their next appearance at the CCWF, and that stands for California Central Women's Facility, located in Chowchilla, California. They're planning on being there February 15th of this year. And the whole reason they're even getting in is because Amy is friends with someone on the inside who works there. I'd love to get them banned for six months, but to do that, I need my Rainbow Warriors to make a phone call or to write a simple email and send it to the right people, people I have info for. A sample email might read something like this. Dear Mr. Broomfield, I'm concerned that Amy Ichikawa and Women to Women is being allowed back into CCWF after previously having been denied. She supports the author of Serial Killers in Heaven and Victims in Hell and the light side of serial killers. Victims have been damaged and harmed by her careless actions. She was previously granted a six-month pass to go into the facility, which resulted in her harming victims by promoting the people who killed their loved ones. The person who constantly lets her in is Courtney Waybright. Amy has proudly put Courtney's support publicly all over social media. As the customer relationship manager, should Courtney not consider the ramification of the victims? Please stop Courtney from letting her in. Their friendship should not come before the safety of CCWF population and definitely should not come before victims' rights. Amy has also loudly supported the Proud Boys by marching with them, and she is touting a dangerous rhetoric against the LGBTQ community even going as far as to call for violence against the trans community. After going into the facility, she's done three international interviews and many domestic that contain dangerous and violent calls to action, including supporting contraband in the prison by putting out cell phone photos inside the prison by those she supports. Please stop her from going in on February 15th, and please provide a six-month ban. I will put that sample letter, phone number, and email addresses in the show notes. For our true crime quickie, I thought it important to maybe spend the last part of this episode by remembering some trans people who've died over the years in prison. Oftentimes, a trans person will take their own life because the pain of ridicule and non-acceptance by others is so hurtful they just can't anymore. I wanted to focus on a few of those trans sisters who have succumbed to the hate. Hate from groups such as turf, fundamentalists, and overzealous religions, extreme right-wing politicians and white supremacy groups, and hate from individual people, people who have chosen not to educate themselves from what they fear, people who judge others by the lifestyles they lead, and even children whose parents have not taught them not just tolerance, but acceptance of people who might be a little different than they are. In 2017, 25-year-old Jenna Mitchell, a trans woman, was incarcerated at Valdosta State Prison in Georgia. This is an all-male prison. She suffered from some mental issues, including gender dysphoria and depression. While being held in solitary confinement for what the prison said was for her own protection, And let me just tell you a little something about solitary confinement for most prisoners. It's torture. I mean, think about the people who went a little nuts during COVID-19 quarantine. Jenna had been in solitary for over two weeks. She'd written her mom a letter that sounded very much like a suicide note. Her mother phoned the prison on December 2nd, and she told the prison personnel about the letter she received from her daughter. She told them she was worried about Jenna and that she might try to harm herself. Two days later, Jenna was found hanging from a solitary cell. When she was found, she was somehow breathing, and she was put on life support. Jenna didn't make it, although she might have had the prison officials had the proper tools to cut her down right then and there. 
Instead, they had to go to another part of the prison where the medical unit was and get scissors, then head back to solitary to cut Jenna down. And then the paperwork was written with false statements to cover the prison personnel's asses. You better bet Jenna's family sued the hell out of this Georgia prison, and they received a $2.2 million settlement, which is still a pitiful amount when you weigh it against the life of a loved one. In 2015, 21-year-old trans woman Vicki Thompson would be found dead in her UK all-male prison cell from hanging. Vicki had written a letter just prior to her partner Bob Still. In the letter, she said she didn't know how long she would last in there, and she just didn't feel like she wanted to be there anymore. She signed off with, I'm going to go now because I just can't stop crying. Two weeks later, in another UK prison, another trans woman would take her own life. 38-year-old Joanne Latham's attorney told the court his client is essentially a woman and should be sent to the New Hall Women's Prison, but the court assigned her to an all-male prison, and in her prison cell, she barricaded the door and covered the observation panel. When prison personnel entered her cell, they found her dead with a ligature around her neck. In a Southern California male prison in September 2022, 41-year-old trans woman Kylie Minali was killed by her cellmate. Kylie's 61-year-old cellmate beat her for over an hour until she died. Apparently, prison guards weren't making their regularly scheduled rounds, and they didn't even find her until some other prisoners told them that she had been beaten and they no longer heard her. Kylie's family is in the middle of a lawsuit against the Riverside County Prison. In 2019, the court system refused to put a trans woman, 27-year-old Laylene Extravaganza Cubalet Polanco, in the women's population of Rikers Island in New York. Instead, they put her in solitary confinement. Laylene suffered from a seizure disorder, and she died from seizures while in solitary. Now, while I realize something needs to be done with our broken justice system and our broken prison systems, I do think an all-trans prison might just be a resolution. But at the same time, I don't want to take focus off the purpose of this episode, and that's of TERF and the Amy Ichikawa cult called Women to Women. They are two different entities, but working with the smaller one of Women to Women might be a good way to start ending some of the hate towards our trans brothers and sisters and for the LGBTQ in general. I'd love to try to shut down this turf bullshit as much as possible, and definitely have women to women look at their group and maybe reconstruct it. So please put this Amy Ichikawa woman on your watch list. Keep an eyeball on her and the stunts she pulls and the hate that boils from within her and her cult, uh, ministries. Shut her down wherever possible. If she has zero to minimal audience, Her words aren't effective. Same for J.K. Rowling and anyone who regurgitates hateful sentiments. And if you can please strike out against them with a phone call or an email. Again, I'll leave the sample note, phone number, and emails of who they should go to in my show notes. The sooner you can help, the better. I'm sure you are all just as tired as I am of all the negative bullshit people throw into the universe, and it sticks. We don't have time for it. No one has time for it. Life's too short. If you want to be a loving, positive, and supportive person, then come on in. All others can fuck off with your bad attitudes and angsty energy. I love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. And remember, it's not a crime to live your truth. Unless some dickhead comes along and tries to make it a crime. Oh, and unless you're a murderer, of course. (laughs) 